Well, in light of that, I, I should probably also mention that back in 2003, Prince Charles made international headlines when he asked the Royal Society, one of the most prestigious clubs of scientists, to seriously look at the risks of nanotechnology. And, and he, in a sense, he brought nanotechnology into the mainstream because it was all over the news. And thanks to Apple, they put the word nano <laughs> embedded quite nicely in our brains, even though the iPod, as far as I know, has nothing to do with nanotechnology. Just the, you know, that little neuro-linguistic programming, putting that word nano out there for mass consumption so that we all become more comfortable with it, the word and the idea, and you know, we, we all love our iPods. But getting back to Prince Charles and this, this when he made headlines back in 2003, the, the headline simply read this, Prince Charles, Grey Goo Threat to the World. So, you know, it's interesting because I know that governments and political leaders, we all know that they like to rule by fear, they like to instigate fear. We know that, you know, uh, the father of this world likes to instigate that as often as possible. But at the same time, if I'm being fair and balanced here, the concern that he voiced that was picked up by the mainstream press back then is a legit one. I mean, just think about this whole gray goose scenario where it's like a swarm. Just think of, envision a tornado, a, a gray looking tornado that just roams the planet and, and again consumes any organic life that crosses its path. Or if you want to think about it in a pop culture sense uh, from what Hollywood has given us, think about the, I believe it was the final scene in the remake, the Keanu Reeves remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still. Now think about that, but multiply that by about 100. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Eric Drexler, considered by many to be the father of nanotechnology after he authored a book back in 1986 called Engines of Creation, which was written when nanotechnology was little more than a conception, wrote quite extensively on this gray goo, gray goo excuse me. And why? Because he's the one that coined the phrase. Drexler proposed a nanomachine 1,000 times thinner than a human hair that could copy itself in 1,000 seconds. In the next 1,000 seconds, the two machines would build two more, and so on and so forth. At the end of 10 hours, there would not be 36 machines, but 68 billion. And the quote that got a lot of attention back then was this one. In less than a day, they would weigh a ton. In less than two days, they would outweigh the Earth. In another four hours, they would exceed the mass of the sun and all the planets combined. Now, to make sure we keep things in perspective here, I know, I realize that's an extreme. And it, we're obviously not right up against that. And I obviously, I, I personally don't think that that's in our future. But what, my reason for bringing it up is to, again, just kind of make the case that this is a threat presented by this technology, a threat that's admitted to by all the proponents of this technology who want to study it more, fund it more, advance it more. And, and yet, you know, we're just going to let them do what they want to do or we're not going to try to sound the alarm about this type of thing or be mindful of it. I mean, it, I, I just want to call attention to it in some way, shape, or form. And to, put it, to, to further put it into perspective, those who dabble in nanomedicine have said that you could fit a trillion nanobots into a single pill. So when we talk about gray goo and the amount of nanobots it would take to create a problem, like the one I just described for you out of Drexler's uh, uh, famous book, it, it becomes clear that it would have to be a collective or a hive mind type of situation. Again, similar to what we saw in that uh, Star Trek board clip. The, the bottom line, which you'll probably hear me say several more times before I'm through here today, is that I want to emphasize to all of you that this is not science fiction. This is science fact. It's far from fear-mongering and hyperbole, too. But let's not, let's not dance around 
uh, you know, with these, these formalities any longer in, in defining what nanotechnology is and the threats that it pose. I want to jump right in and, and just share some of my observations and why I have the sneaking suspicion that nanotechnology is going to play a dark and devious role in the future fulfillment of end times prophecy. Even if I can't, even if I can't quite conceptualize it all or verbalize it all as well as I'd like to and as clearly as I'd like to, there's just something about this that the Lord has put on my heart and say, look, you just, just look a little closely at this. So let's prayerfully consider any of the possible scenarios. And, and like I always do, those of you who are familiar with uh, any of the podcasts or the website, please, before I present anything, just, just let me remind you that what you're about to hear is my own personal speculation, taking what we clearly read in God's Word about what we know is coming, uh, adding that to the body of evidence that exists around us as fact, and just simply making an educated guess about it. Of course, I could be wrong. Of course. Um, so, so just take anything that you hear to the Lord in prayer and let him speak to you about such things uh, as far as uh, whether or not it's true or could be a plausible scenario. We'll start with nanotechnology's possible connection to the infamous Mark of the Beast prophecy. And the verse that this is all going to center on, I know there are several that, that talk about that uh, ancient prophecy, but the one I want uh, us to concentrate on is Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. And he causes, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. For the longest time, many people, myself included, have believed that RFID implants would one day be the actual fulfillment of this prophecy. At this point in time, however, and after all of my research into nanotech, limited research at that, I, I don't think that that's true, at least not in the sense that I have up, still, up until this point. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I believe that the RFID implants are merely a precursor and part of the whole conditioning process. Or to put it another way, probably a better way, I would say that they are going to play a key role, RFID implants, but until they merge with nanotechnology in some way, they won't really become the fulfillment of the mark of the beast or uh, contribute to the fulfillment of that. While the mark of the beast and the fate of those who accept it is, of course, no laughing matter, I, I just had to laugh at the way in which, again, those beautiful mysteries, the way in which God seemed to be orchestrating events that were reported in the news uh, just from this past week alone. Because right on cue, Bloomberg Businessweek reported on this past Tuesday, September 28, 2010, that the author of a European report into the roots of the global financial crisis is suggesting that leaders of the group of 20 nations must build a more harmonized global currency system to prevent the risk of competitive devaluations. A global currency, calling for it in the news just a few days ago. Of course, we all know that a global economy with a, a global currency needs to be in place in order to fulfill end times Bible prophecy. So isn't it fitting that this news emerges at precisely the same time that we're talking about this possibility of nanotechnology somehow playing a key role in the entire Mark of the Beast system? But here's what I find extremely compelling about this line of thinking and, and why I want to explore it a little further. If you just go pick up any trade publication or go online, uh, jump on Google even, and look up the various think tank reports on nanotech and its anticipated applications to daily life, you'll find that most analysts have always assumed that advances in nanotech would do away with the whole system of buying and selling. The system that we're so used to today. I mean, think back to the pros that I shared with you. They, they think that it's going to eliminate any scarcity that exists. 
That's because nanotechnology is expected to be able to drastically reduce production costs and perhaps even make shortages or supply and demand a distant memory, a thing of the past. However, as Christians who study God's word and particularly those having to do with the last days, what are we told? We're told the complete opposite is in our future. Just look at that verse that I, that I, I read to you a few minutes ago. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, it's all there. It says that there is an economic system still in place at that time and that no one, whether rich or poor, can buy or sell unless they have this mark. So admittedly, at that point in my research, I was a little confused. I mean, you know, I was discouraged a little bit because I'm thinking, wait a minute. How come my theory that nanotech is somehow connected to the mark of the beast system have any merit whatsoever given what scientists believe about it eliminating an economic system and, and, and given this apparent disconnect here? How can that be? Of course, I prayed about it and prayed about it a little more. And it, it, it just seemed to, it seemed to be right there in front of us. There's a very good reason why we should begin to question whether or not nanotechnology could play a part in helping to fulfill what we read about the mark of the beast. Do you recall a story from last year? I believe it was May of 2009, uh, coming out of the UK. And it, what, what is it with the UK, right? I mean, there's always, there's always some uh, unusual stories coming out of there. But do you remember the story about a, a British scientist who became the first human to be infected with a computer virus after he deliberately contaminated an electronic chip which was then inserted into his hand? That was last year. An RFID chip implanted into man gets a computer virus that he put there willingly, all in the name of science, and re researchers now confirm that they have found that uh, implanted identity chips can pick up computer viruses. The man was uh, Reading University's Mark Gasson, who conducted an experiment to show how radio frequency identity chips, or the RF RFID, could become electronically infected. He said the device was programmed with a virus which could transfer itself to other electronic systems it came in contact with. Any other chips that interacted with the infected systems would also contract the virus, he said, raising the possibility that in the future, advanced medical devices such as pacemakers could become quite vulnerable to cyber attacks. Now, at the time, everyone treated it as a cutesy little story about what can sometimes happen when man marries machine. Some people thought it was pretty cool. I, man, what can I do to, to upgrade myself? I mean, forget about the virus, I just won't put the virus there. But I'll, I'll put a chip in me and do all sorts of cool things with it. 